Hello, everybody. My name is Sundance, and I'm doing the Green Party Spotlight for January 2021. The title I chose for this presentation is The Green Party and the Future. I'm stepping way out of my comfort zone because I don't generally do videos of taking a stand on any issue, and I don't think I'm an in front of a camera kind of a person, but I believe in everything I'm going to say, and I hope you stay with me until the end. My plan is to discuss problems with the current state of our nation and offer a few brief examples of that without taking up too much time. Then I intend to talk about how, in order for things to get better in the future, we need to make some kind of transition from the institutions we're comfortable with and be open to new things that present us with better opportunities than what we have now, most notably the Green Party. Most of what I have to say is from my own perspective, not so much statistics and citing studies. And I won't say too much about myself, except that I'm old enough that I got a college friend who mentioned Woody to me, and she was talking about Woody from Toy Story, and I thought she was talking about Woody Woodpecker. Do with that what you will. And I'm reading from my notes because if I don't, I'm going to go blank and forget everything I was going to say. But that being said, I'm also not a big YouTuber. I don't like to watch videos longer than 20 minutes, so I'm going to be brief with this. And as you may have noticed, I naturally sound like the voice on your answering machine that tells you to press 2 to check your messages. We seem to be living in harsh times. I don't know when or where you'll see this video, but as I'm recording it, it's early 2021 in the United States. There's a transition from a controversial Republican president to a controversial Democrat president. The world is still heavily affected by COVID-19, all types of inequality, and unprecedented environmental crises. In the midst of all that, a person has just been voted as the new president primarily by saying he's not as bad as the other guy. That's what I see in the world around me right now, and that's what affects what I'm seeing right now. And I want to start with the bad part and end with the good part. First is the status quo. When we look to elected officials to fix problems, there are certain factors they list as measures of success. For me, the word issues comes to mind. That all started with Hillary Clinton while she was having a Black Lives Matter activist removed from her rally. And after that, she said, back to the issues. I don't know what these issues were, but social justice apparently wasn't one of them. It seemed like she, as well as other elected officials, like us to only look at certain factors to measure their success, these factors that they call issues. And it seems like these issues are all things that can be used to say they're doing something good without actually getting anything done. I used to call that kind of credit brownie points. And I think economic examples are good for explaining what I'm talking about. One of those examples is the economy. Democrats and Republicans seem to like reporting that they've done a great job because the economy has improved. The premise is there's more money in the system, therefore everybody has a somewhat better quality of life due to the extra money available, and everything seems fine if you just stop there. It gets problematic if you don't. Suppose there were just two people in the economy. One of them loses $1,000 while the other one gains $1,001,000. If you look at them both together, the economy has improved because there's a million more dollars in the economy than there was before, but that does nothing for the person who lost $1,000. Just saying the economy has improved makes a politician look good, even if it only benefits a small percentage of the population with the brownie points. And there seems to be a similar situation with the concept of job creation. Elected officials tend to report that they've done well because the number of jobs they've created, created so many, and it doesn't matter if these jobs pay money or not. I did notice that pretty much every fast food restaurant I see has a sign that says they're hiring. Whether or not that would be enough to pay for college or buy a house remains in question. But certainly just saying more money is in the system or more employment positions are available has been a way to say an elected official is doing a good job without the official doing anything and without anything getting better. The only way improving the economy is good for everybody is if the money is distributed more evenly. And that's a socialist concept, which is contradictory to the capitalist parties we tend to support. Another example 
of these issues and these brownie points might be a person getting killed by law enforcement and our government responding to it by wearing a ceremonial cloth and kneeling and then doing nothing else. One might get plenty of brownie points for doing that, but it doesn't exactly solve the problem that it's still legal to kill people, apparently. I believe these symbolic acts would not be considered acceptable if people had more options. I also wanted to mention as an example, the lesser of two evils. I vaguely remember around the time I was watching Woody Woodpecker, people saying Democrats are a good option because they'll do the right thing. Lately, that seems to have changed into a situation in which Democrats say we should just ignore their faults because they're the lesser of two evils. But lesser of two evils could only make sense if there were only two options. And only if we accept the notion that just a little bit of evil is somehow an acceptable amount of evil. Maybe if you get robbed, but the robber says the other guy would have taken more money than he did, then you're okay because you just got robbed a little bit, relatively. Lesser of two evils isn't something you accept because you think it's acceptable. It's something you accept because you don't have any other options. And that's why we need more options than just Democrats and Republicans. The two larger parties don't always seem to function as opposing groups. I'm reminded of a local congresswoman where I am, Sharice Davis, who was asked why she voted no on the COVID-19 relief package. She said people need the relief package, but she voted no because she didn't think the package had enough bipartisan support for our president to sign it. It almost seems like that statement alone is everything that's wrong with Democrats and Republicans. I don't like to talk much about violence a lot, but in this case, I think it makes a good analogy. If you can imagine you're about to get attacked by three people and your friend is there and your friend decides to help them attack you, then when you ask about it later, the friend says, well, you were gonna get beat up anyway. That's what it seems like to me when the Congress person says, I know you need this, but I voted no because it wasn't gonna pass anyway. The possibility that America wants or needs something and those needs can be denied unless it makes these two groups happy is why we need to decrease our dependency on these two groups. We need more than just these two political parties playing a significant role in our government so it will be harder for Democrats and Republicans to stifle our nation by just pointing fingers at each other and saying our side can't do anything because of the other side. There are certain issues neither group seems to have any desire to address. One example being consequences for police officers. Another example being environmental concerns. For me, it was a bit frustrating that the Democrats seem to have very little to say about abuse for law enforcement and have no interest in using their elected positions to address the problems. For some, it might be frustrating when the government shuts down because, because two groups can't agree and the lawmakers have little personal consequence for letting disagreements shut things down. Lesser of two evils might seem acceptable to an adequately privileged person, but it becomes less tolerable when you're the direct target of the remaining portion of evil. We have allowed ourselves to believe our government would be fixed by periodically switching from one side to the other, regardless of how often we've tried both sides. I wanna tell you another thing about me I actually grew up in a church, and it was a black church. And one of the things I noticed in church is when the preacher says, I won't keep you long, he's going to keep you there all day. When the preacher says, I'm almost done, you probably need to have a few snacks and maybe a five-hour energy drink. I think they do it on purpose. But I'm not a preacher, and I really am almost done. on cutting losses, people may think of lesser of two evils as cutting their losses. And there may be times when the best people can do is cut their losses. But if your plan is forever about just losing a little bit at a time, you're going to be losing forever. Cutting your losses may be a good short-term plan, but things won't ever get better until something else changes. I don't think we should be about lowering our expectations and cutting losses. I think we should be about raising expectations and placing our support and concerns where they're more respected. And that doesn't seem to come from Democrats or Republicans. A lot of people seem to think government resources should only be used for defense or national security. 
Some people talk about government needing to be smaller, but the people who want smaller government don't ever seem to think those reductions or those reductions in size or spending should come from defense or national security. And I think this is all a notion fed to us by the government, perhaps because defense and national security are two areas of government in which any amount of money can be spent and for the sake of defense and national security, nobody has to say exactly where all that money went. There is no actual accountability. When we start accepting government leaders that talk about spending money with no accountability, our government seems to be not much different from teams that play professional sports. We just pick a team and hope our team beats the other. But government can be more than that. Government is supposed to support and accommodate its citizens. When I was trying to plan what I would say, I figured aside from people interested in Green Party, my main audience or target audience would probably be people who were not exactly feeling fulfilled by Democrats, but saw that as the best of the two options that they knew of. I really didn't have that much to say that I even thought would be of interest to Republicans. But the part about government services being reduced seems to be the one thing that I think everybody should think about. If government is supposed to be for the people and governments are funded by the people, we should be able to expect more than just war and national security against a threat that may or may not be there. Even if you're pleased with war and national security, one has to wonder why resources can't be dedicated to education art or stopping the destruction of our environment, which may be a more immediate threat than potential threats from people who don't even want to go to war with us. The main problem people seem to have with third parties is some belief that those parties can never win anything, and that can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. But winning isn't just about getting enough votes. Winning is about building up to a victory. And winning for a political party isn't just about running for president. There are state candidates you can vote for without worrying about whatever candidate you think is going to be the next Trump. If you're tired of the status quo, you have to stop voting for the status quo. People would like you to believe socialist is a bad word, but socialism is about people. Government that isn't for the people shouldn't exist. As I said at the beginning, the title I chose for this presentation is The Green Party and the Future. And that's because I think supporting the Green Party now is laying the foundation for the future. You may think you can't step out of the comfort zone of Democrats or Rep Republicans because the rest is unknown. But we also need to think about where our country is headed. When we get to the point that police officers kill people and our government says that's legal, and when we get to the point that the President of the United States condones people attacking the White House, we need to ask ourselves if it's time for a change. If a man in a moose outfit can take over the White House, we might need to look at ourselves. I don't know if he was a raccoon man or a buffalo man, doesn't matter. People seem to be hesitant to place their support in people who want to make things better because they think those people won't be able to change things immediately. They think they'd be better off placing all of their support with the people who are in power right now just because they have the power, the can-win candidates. But that power these candidates have is useless if they won't do anything good with it. As long as the people with the power aren't doing anything good, there's nothing to lose by supporting somebody different. And with that support comes the power. It may not happen overnight, but it'll happen over time. Supporting people who are trying to do the right thing will chip away at the status quo and place those well-meaning people in a position to eventually change things. Even if you can't bring yourself to vote for somebody different, you can take the time to see what else is out there. The first time I came to a Green Party meeting, I already, I already knew I was done with Democrats. But I was also pleasantly surprised by the attitudes and the way of thinking of the people around me. I heard people saying things I just don't hear Democrats say. And even if you don't intend to change the way you vote, you should pay attention to the Green Party. A lot of this presentation has been about myself and what I think, not because I think I'm so noteworthy or all-knowing, but more because when it comes to the things I want and expect from my government, I think maybe I'm not the only one who sees these things going on and feels like something has to change. My name is Sundance, and this is the end of my presentation, and I thank you for taking the time to listen.